historical sites. So, I mean, our routes are going through beautiful towns and villages and historical sites. Um, and there's plenty of ch uh, opportunity to have a nice lunch as well, which is very important to most of our guests. Lunch is always important. Yeah. You're quite vulnerable. Absolutely. Is it dangerous and is it difficult to get travel insurance for a trip like a cycling tour? Yeah, I mean, most of our routes uh, we sort of carefully selected. So we plan all the routes and provide maps and route notes. Uh, and they're generally in sort of rural or quieter locations, so away from any sort of heavy traffic. Um, and we do we do recommend the guests take a cycle helmet, though, just in case. Um, you don't need any sort of um, special insurance um, for our holidays. We do You do have to have um, sort of a general travel policy, um, and we can suggest some people that... Um, offer such policies so probably the best way to do this is just get an annual travel insurance policy and that will cover you for our leisure cycling tours you're listening to the travel show with john Gwynn on ukhealthradio.com still to come on the show travel news but at the moment i'm speaking to miles porter who's head of activities at cycling for softies we've talked about cycling in general terms cycling holidays that is now we're going to find out more about the company uh, who they are and how they protect your money Yep, so we're a specialist um, cycling holiday tour operator. Um, so we've been going since 1981, organising um, holidays mainly in France. Um, we also operate a sister brand called Bespoke Tours, um, who, so we offer a similar cycling and walking holiday product. We're actually part of um, a wider company called Ski Solutions, so one of the UK's largest ski tour operators. Do you offer your clients any financial protection? There are cycling tours which don't have at all anything because they don't do flights. But do you are you uh, tied by the package travel regulations, or do you have any sort of financial protection? Yep, yeah, we do. So we're fully um, at all and ABSA bonded. Mm -hmm. um, so we guarantee all our all our guests uh, complete financial protection for their holiday. So, and we do organise travel as well from the UK. So we have to have that at all license. So that's the whole package then. So, I mean, with other tours yeah. which are similar, that you have to get your own way there, and if the flight's cancelled, you've got problems. So you take care of yeah. everything, so that's really useful. Yeah. yeah. But with the fall of the pound since Brexit, has that caused you any problems because of European tours? Does it mean you've... I mean, some APTA members that say we need to put, add a surcharge because of the currency. Is that something that's affected you so far? Um, not so far. Um, I mean, once people have booked, um, we would, we wouldn't charge them anymore. So we do, um, uh, we do cost in, um, for any sort of exchange rate fluctuations throughout the course of the year. So yes, customers are, they can be safe in the knowledge that once they've booked, then we won't increase prices. That's good to hear. I used to be a travel agent and the worst call in the world is when you ring up and say, sorry, the tour operators put the price up. You have to pay more. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that's yep. good. Yes, uh, it's the first time I actually heard that from somebody since Brexit, so uh, it's a big tick. Oh, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> so what do you offer? Are you just for experienced cyclists? You said the e-bikes you do as well. So could somebody just yeah. go on the first ever holiday review, or should they practice beforehand? Um, no, as long as they're sort of relatively um, healthy and uh, they can obviously ride a bike, uh, it's quite important, mm -hmm. then you don't have to have gone on a cycling holiday before. Um, so we do have, most of our tours are suitable for uh, first-time cyclists, um, people going on a, their first cycling holiday, mm -hmm. um, particularly families as well. Um, and we basically take care of uh, everything behind the scenes, so we make sure that the whole process is really easy and smooth for the client. So all we have to do is focus on enjoying the holiday and, and getting from A to B, basically. Um, what routes do you offer? What's your itineraries at the moment? Um, so at the moment, uh, we offer a range of uh, luxury cycling holidays uh, across Europe. Um, mainly, we offer self-guided um, tours, although we are introducing some more guided products. Mm -hmm. um, we have 11 tours um, across France, Italy, and Spain. Uh, and we organize the full package, so we can organize travel from the UK. Uh, we have offer hotels on a bed and breakfast board basis. Um, evening meals are included, so either at the, the guest hotel or in the local restaurant. Fully equipped bikes, and the luggage transfers between the hotels. And then we also supply maps and route notes about the area. And we have a local representative on hand who'll be able to go through all the details of their holiday, 
um, recommend the best places for them to visit and, and so forth. We're getting to the end of this year. Do you have anything new planned for uh, 2017? Uh, yes. So we mainly been a, a specialist in France, although this year is the first year we're actually going to branch out and be offering tours in Italy and Spain. Mm -hmm. Um, so in Italy, we're introducing tours in the, the Sud Tyrol and Lake Garda, so up in the north of uh, the country. And then also in Spain, we're introducing uh, a Catalonian tour that sort of generally follows the, the route of the Costa Brava. You can follow me on Twitter at holiday underscore hut. One of the great things about having two guests on your show is that you get to talk about food twice. As you know, food's very important to me, and that's what we're going to talk about now. Uh, Cycling for Soft Days do provide uh, meal plans, so I wanted to know if somebody like me, who's a difficult person to feed, whether they can be catered for. I bring this up on my show every week. I'm a vegan. It's part of the rules of being a vegan. You have to mention it every opportunity. So if somebody's got a specific yep. <laughs> dietary request such as mine, can you cater for that? So it's not just mine, it's if they're gluten-free or whatever. Do you arrange meals for, for the hotels, or is that something the customer has to sort out for themselves? Uh, it probably depends exactly on the on the direct request, but we do always advise the hotels and restaurants that we book uh, of any of the uh, guest direct requests. Um, and they can always uh, make adjustments. So once they arrive um, in their region, our local reps can always um, change a restaurant or kind of find something that's going to suit their, suit their needs a bit better. The last time me and my wife went on a cycling trip, we didn't make it to the end of the uh, driveway for the hotel before my wife had enough. You, now, you do gourmet <laughs> tours and you do wine tours. What if a couple really fancy the locations, but one of them doesn't want to cycle? Is there anything to take care of the one who just wants to uh, watch everybody go off? Do you look after them as yeah, well? So, yeah, yeah, we do. We, we occasionally have that sort of request. So uh, there's a couple of options. Um, generally, we advise people to have a single centre stay. So where we could um, offer various cycling routes, but also somewhere that's going to be um, offer sort of non-cycling activities. Um, and we do actually have sometimes people who would, uh, if they weren't cycling, they would actually move between the hotels when we transfer the luggage, which mm -hmm. is a bit unusual, but it means that, you, you know, the other person can kind of follow the same, the same route and experience all different hotels and restaurants that the, the cyclist would. Yeah. Stick my wife in the back of the van and be an ideal holiday. Yeah. <laughs> you cover a few countries now. Does that mean you do tours all year round or are you just for the spring, summer months? Yep. Yeah, so most of our tours uh, operate between May and September. Um, although some of our new products that we've um, introduced, for example, Catalonia, that runs all year except January to March. Mm -hmm. And we have got a new cycling holiday in Portugal actually through our sister brand Bespoke Tours, and that runs year-round because they have fantastic weather down the Algarve, so it's actually better to do that out of the summer months. Now for a really tough question. It's always difficult to ask this one. Uh, what sort of leading prices do you have? Uh, leading price uh, for a, a long weekend would be 585 per person, and that would include the hotel accommodation, breakfast and dinner, uh, bikes, uh, all the, the guide to the region um, and obviously the support from the local rep. But we have um, we have holidays anything from three nights up to two weeks, so we have quite a quite a range. I'll be worn out after a two week one. I don't think I can handle a weekend one. I need to get fit. <laughs> I definitely need to get fit. Yep. I guess you get to sample the trips. Which would be your favourite route if you were given next week off? Uh, that is a tough question because uh, you have so many different options, but mm -hmm. fantastic. Uh, I personally would say Provence, um, mm -hmm. mainly because it's got beautiful towns and villages to visit. Um, and the Mediterranean climate and the cuisine are, uh, yeah, definitely some of my favourite. Mm -hmm. As well as the glass of wine as well down there is uh, fantastic. What's the difference between cycling for softies and bespoke tours? Uh, the main difference is um, cycling softies, we include evening meals. So we select um, the best um, either hotel, restaurant um, in the town of the guest staying uh, for their evening meal. Uh, bespoke tour is fairly similar in terms of its self-guided leisure cycling tours. Mm -hmm. um, although we do feature a slightly wider program. So we also offer holidays in Croatia, Germany, Austria, 
as well as um, uh, several walking trips as well. Um, but yeah, they're fairly similar in terms of overall product. But for a first time trip, cycling with the softies would be the better option. Yes, definitely for, yeah. And finally, how do we find out more about Cycling for Softies and for your um, sister brands as well? Yep, so um, we've actually got uh, our new website coming out next week, so on the 7th of November. Um, you can find that at www.cyclingforsofties.com. Um, our sister brand is Bespoke Tours, which is um, bespoketours.com. And we both have both of our new brochures coming out on the 14th of November. So you can order that through the website or give us a call and we'll happily um, send you a copy of that and help you out with your uh, inquiry. As always, websites mentioned on the show can be found at facebook.com slash John Gwynn Travel Show, and that includes the one for Grenada, which I forgot to mention about earlier. Just look for the post for the uh, John Gwynn Travel Show 3rd of November, and at the end of the post there will be a list of the websites mentioned. If you've been on a cycling holiday or if you've been to Grenada, you can also use the Facebook page to share your experiences, pictures, videos, what you found, tips and things you feel we should avoid. Facebook.com slash John Gwynn Travel Show. Checking it out before you check in on the John Gwynn Travel Show on UKHealthRadio.com. And now travel news. Heathrow Airport has released figures that show that just under half, 49%, of the 25,200 noise complaints it received this summer were from the same 10 people. Three of them complained more than 1,280 times over the three-month period, which works out of an average of nearly 14 complaints a day. Heathrow said it received an average of 274 complaints every day for the three months of July, August and September. Most of the complaints, 3,944, came from people living in Slough, but these were from only 22 people. In total, complaints came from 2,128 people. Last year, Heathrow accused anti-expansion campaigners of using automated software to email complaints whenever an aircraft was due to fly overhead. It said that it discovered that technology was being used when people operating it forgot to turn the clocks back in the autumn, which meant that dozens of email complaints were received before the flights even took off. Sticking with Heathrow and the expansion, I did look around the uh, travel world, well, English-speaking travel world, because I can't speak any other languages, being an English person, to see how the uh, news of Heathrow was received by people in Australia, Canada and America. And to be honest... I didn't seem to care to make any news. The one through I did find was from a newswire, which meant that the magazine couldn't even be bothered to write their own article about it. They bought one from somebody else. But anyway, uh, the former head of the Airports Commission has claimed that legal challenges against the uh, expansion at Heathrow will fail due to the weight of evidence in favour of the third runway. So Howard Davies said that the major objections to the runway, which include pollution, were not sustainable. When he was speaking to the Times, he denied that claims that his inquiry, which took two and a half years to uh, conclude, was biased in favour of uh, Heathrow, insisting that such a legal challenge was complete nonsense. He was making his first public comments since the government finally endorsed his report last week by backing plans for the third runway. Under the plan, a two-mile runway will be built by the end of 2025, and at the moment, they reckon it's going to cost £17.6 billion. The runway, which could be built on a ramp over the M25, would enable the airport to increase flights up to 740,000 a year. A residence group from Teddington in south-west London issued a legal warning to the Department for Transport last week, alleging bias by Sir Howard. This stemmed from his role at uh, GIC Private Limited, which is one of Heathrow's shareholders but he said he resigned from there when he joined the commission. So Howard said that the Teddington Action Group had repeatedly tried and failed to, pr- to prove bias. Meanwhile, the newspaper revealed that figures from the Valuation Office Agency show that the government cut to rateable value of Heathrow from £247.5 million to £215 million at a, a five-year re at uh, l- announced last month. 
On this basis, Heathrow, which remains the highest rate 